another interesting thing is both of you guys were told at a very young age that you were gonna end up in prison for the rest of your lives, which is insane. Hi, you guys, welcome back to our channel. Today, I am so over the moon excited for this interview. We have our dear friend slash brother, Daryl, who I interviewed, we did a three part or four part series, I can't remember, right when Daryl was awarded parole. He was actually a lifer. Adam was also a lifer. They were incarcerated together for a few years. They each moved to a different facility. They were apart for a really long time. And then they got out. They both were awarded their release. And it's kind of an interesting story. I'm not going to tell. I'll let them do it. So first of all, Daryl, hi, welcome back. Thank you so much for being here and welcome home. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. So why don't you guys, I don't know how you want to do this. Just want to go ahead and talk about how you met each other inside, how you became so close. You first. You're the host. All right. Well, I vividly recall being introduced to Daryl through a friend. I remember a guy came to me. At this time, I was serious into the working out. Like, that was my main focus. And everybody knew that. You know, I was running classes at the time. And guy comes to me, goes, hey, there's this new guy that just hit the compound. He's like, man, this guy, he's just like you, man. He's another workout guy. Like, just go, go, go. He's like, you got to meet him. I said, all right. Yeah. When, when we get, he's like, no, you got to come meet him now. <laughs> I said, all right. <laughs> but I remember coming down there and uh, just instantly I was like, man, like this, this is a guy I want to spend more time around. Like just great energy, his enthusiasm. And we just clicked and it was like, okay, like, Man, when, when are we getting together? When are we working out? Like, what are we going to do? What's your uh, side of the story? Adam was pointed out to me before we met, and they're pretty much almost verbatim saying the same thing to me <laughs> that they said to him. I'm like, okay, who's this guy? I got a medium. I got a meeting. And then one day, that's him on the softball field. And remember, you used to rake the softball field. You used to yep. prep it. You know, in prison, you hear a lot about, you got to meet this guy, or this guy's this, or this guy's that. And then you meet the individual, and they don't exactly live up to expectations. So I seen you on the softball field. Of course, he's always been shredded. So that was the giveaway that, okay, this guy's the real deal. The first time that we had kind of like got to spend some time together, it was in the gym. Instantly, I'm like, man, this dude, me and him are going to be best friends. It turned out to be that. We were just, it was like uh, brothers from a different mother. Love that. And from what I hear, I mean, I've never been to prison, but from what I hear from people who've done time over and over and over again, everybody has the same story. It's really hard to trust anybody inside. And I never really trusted anybody. So how did you guys build that bond mm -hmm. that you were able to trust each other like brothers? Because I, as far as I've always been told, that's either really hard to come by or it just doesn't come by. You just don't get that inside. For me, it may be different for you, but I got to Allenwood, I think it was at the end of September. So it was just transitioning to that fall weather where it gets a little cooler. And then everybody seems to gravitate for the most part from the yard to like the library or the gym because of the inclement weather. And I used to go there and I was taking my college courses. So I'd always be at, a, at the library table. Well, you were studying Spanish, if I'm not mistaken. So you would see me in there, and what was different is the library is not your traditional library in prison. It's more like a meeting, a gathering spot. And you and I would say, what's up to each other? You know, we were still in the filling out phase, but you were like, what are you studying? And I told you what I was studying. Like, what are you studying? So instantly we seen right away that it was beyond a physical desire for change and growth and improvement because we were both confronting the intellectual part. And then, you know, in prison, and Adam can speak to this, you may be able to hide your true character and idiosyncrasies for a certain amount of time. But when you spend years together, like he and I did, your true self's going to come out in which other way, good or bad. It was just a genuine friendship from the start. I mean, I know that's really cheesy and corny, but I don't know how else to, to explain it. It was just like we were we were traveling on a journey together, but we were on different roads. But in this case, our roads were so close together that we got on the same path together. Love it. What's your perspective? Well put, man. Well put. Exactly what Daryl said, as far as being in prison, there's so many different individuals and groups that are doing the normal prison 
stuff, what prison culture dictates. So when you get someone that's like going against the grain, doing something different, really focused on intellectual pursuits or a passion for fitness, when you see individuals that have that alternative focus, they stand out. Like Daryl said, there, there's no hiding it. And the more you stand out, you know, the less you can conceal yeah. those yeah. other traits. You said we live in a fishbowl when, you know, you're around people 24 seven, there's no hiding those things. So you get to, to see who someone is pretty quickly and you understand what they're about. And as he said, we were both, we might not have been on the same exact road at that time, but you know, the same exact pursuits, but we were on the same path. So it was easy for us to, to form that connection, not only around the fitness, but around, you know, having somebody that you can talk to on an intellectual level. It's not, you know, running around chasing for talking about the next scam or the next score or a lot of the other stuff that guys get distracted by in prison. To be honest, I would say there was plenty of other people that kind of like saw or wanted to like gravitate towards us, towards what we were doing. But I was always very conscious, and I know Daryl was as well, of like kind of protecting our space. Yeah, for sure. You know, space is at a premium in prison, right? You only got tiny little oh, spots. Absolutely. absolutely. Especially if you're sh who you're sharing your space with, both individually and alone, but who all's in your space. Yep. And that space even becomes more of a rare commodity and highly prized. And you want to be protective of that. Absolutely. In prison, particularly with white guys that come in, they gravitate towards certain groups, gangs, whatnot. You see Adam and I, in a lot of ways, we stood our, on our own two feet. We were friendly with everybody and got along with pretty much a broad spectrum of groups, you know, across racial lines, across different affiliations, but we stood out in the regard that we didn't seek a specific group to join. And you see that, sadly, it's an unfortunate circumstance of, of prison. A lot of white guys come in and that's what happens to them. They get pulled into this vicious cycle of apathy and violence and negativity. And uh, Adam and I didn't do that. We walked our own path, but we walked our, our own path in a very constructive and positive manner. I absolutely love that you brought that up because a question that I got a lot from people on the outside for so many years was, I don't understand. I thought basically you had to affiliate yourself with a group in order to survive prison. So how I always got the question about Adam, but you can both speak to this. How did you survive for so long? Both of you, we have 20 years and 26 years, right? 26, 23, 24, 24, 24 years. How did you both survive so long without affiliating yourself with a group? How does that work? That's a great question. And that builds off of, you know, what Daryl was just saying. It's not only that we chose to walk a different path. Believe me, there were people that approached us about joining them. And, mm -hmm. and especially when you see a, a couple of young, strong guys, confident, obviously those are attributes that, you know, people are going to gravitate towards. I know that we both had some of those difficult conversations with people and let them know, like, listen, this is the path I'm on. I'm not deviating. Well, if you want to step away and come this way, I'll support you right. in that, but I am not going down that path with you. And that's, that's a very fine line to walk, to be confident, but to not be viewed as a threat, to be able to stand on your own but not have it seen as, you know, putting it back in a groups, like that you're denying them outright. Like, nah, man, you guys aren't, you know, if, if you're put them in a negative light, like, oh, you think you're better than us? Right, right. You got to walk a real fine line. And yeah. we were both able to do that. And I'm, I'm sure he's got his stories. I have tons of individual stories. It's been my experience over and over again, those guys that I, developed relationships with who had been in those organizations for long periods, had risen up to those upper echelons. Many of those individuals expressed to me a regret. They'd be like, man, I see what you guys are doing. Yeah. I wish I could do that too. I wish I could step away, but you could hear the despair in their voice. Like I'm so deep in, I can't see yeah. a way out. And sure. there are, there's, there's certain rules. There are certain yeah. aspects of you know, when you're involved in those things that it's not, sometimes it's not possible to step away. Let's just be honest. 
yeah. I'm not going to allow you to do that. For me, I was always very fortunate. I drew a hard line and I've told this before, I think coming in so young with so much time, I was hyper aggressive initially, like in sports and in everything else. I think people were just kind of like, man, this kid's crazy. Let me just like give him a little bit of space. And the guys didn't yeah. want you. <laughs> yeah. They gave me, gave me a little bit of room to move on my own. Yeah. And, and let, to build on your point, let's be honest, when you had the type of sentences you and I had, that adds a certain aura to the individual. Mm -hmm. Even though you and I never took on the philosophy of I don't give an F or any of that, you still couldn't take away the fact that we had this much time. In some ways, there was, okay, leave, those two are serving life sentence, just let them do them. But I would also say on the converse, to be a fly on a wall in, in the prison cells, I'm sure we got hated on too, let's be honest. Oh, absolutely. You know, and uh, I've had some pretty high ranking individuals come to me through the years. In fact, I had one that offered me a substantial amount of money to train them, like in martial arts and stuff like that. And I just I couldn't because that would have been for the wrong reasons. And that's a whole different topic. But I think there was also not only regret some of these high ranking individuals shown, but I come to find a little bit of respect was shown. Like we were able to do that. The credit for me, and I'm sure you're going to reflect the same thing. Like you couldn't have done it without that beautiful woman beside you and the family and the friends, the, your circle of uh, concern that you have. So we had that supporting us that allowed us to go against the green, I think. I don't know if I'm rambling on, but uh, that definitely helped us. You can ramble on about me all day long. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the overarching reason among many that you guys were able to become so close so soon and throughout your incarceration and even now is that you experienced this shared trauma while you were inside. And I can relate to that so much because I met my closest friend in the whole entire world when we were seven years old at summer camp, but that summer camp was run by the cult that we were raised in and we grew up in. So we had a lot of trauma surrounding that and we got so, so, so close. And one thing that we can do to this day, 30 years, 20 something years later, is we could just call each other up and be like, remember the time or just say a phrase. And the other one is hysterical laughing. And I love that I've been able to witness that between you guys recently. Daryl will call and be like, remember the time, da da da, or remember this person, and you'll both just laugh about it. So I would love for each of you to share one of your favorite memories that you guys had with each other while you were inside. Just one? Just one? No, you can share <laughs> as many as you want. I live for this stuff, but whatever you want. Okay, you go first. Well, you brought up White Wednesdays. Well, White Wednesday, we had a guy, actually a friend of Adam's. Adam introduced me to this guy, really good guy. His name's G. He's a black guy from New Jersey. Really good guy. Ended up becoming a really good friend with him. He was the clerk in recreation, so he had this little room that was the clerk's office. And in that office, you had a TV with you know a VHS DVD player. So that's his office. He pretty much dictate who can stay in there with him well adam and i started coming over on wednesday and we'd watch one of the shows that we used to watch was the uh, the daily show and we sometimes when we watched uh jeopardy we watched jeopardy sometimes jeopardy, cash cab cash cab yes totally nerd stuff <laughs> <laughs> various guys maybe some of them were his friends maybe just guys that are bored were trying to come into the room, and if they weren't, they, if it wasn't Adam or I, he'd be like, "Ah, you can't come in. It's White Wednesday." You got to remember, this is a, a a lifer from New York with dreads down to the floor who had no problem telling people the way that he saw it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, we had both of us. You know, I've been friends with G for a long time, and G said, "You know what? You guys want your own night down here." He goes, Wednesday, Wednesday's a perfect night. He goes, man, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna cut it off. Tell everybody else, man, stay away. Like Wednesday is designated night. He goes, I'm gonna call it White Wednesday. <laughs> Adam and Daryl coming down every Wednesday. So yeah, yeah. that was cool. Uh, the three of us. The first thing that comes to my mind, Tai Chi yeah. with uh, Don the Chapel. The yep, yeah, the, that meditation. Yeah. And just us playing ball. I feel bad or I used to feel bad because I'd come down by Daryl's work. I'd be like, hey, 
hey, can you come out, man? Come on out. Get out of work this afternoon. Let's go play some ball. And it wasn't, you know, running basketball full court. It was just he and I playing some one-on-one, like really just hanging out, having a good time together was, it really speaks to the relationship that we built. And again, like kind of doing our own thing. Those are the things, those three things are what stand out most. Although, I mean, I've got some other significant events. What's the game called with the medicine ball? Oh, Hoover ball. Hoover ball. I Hoover ball been sounds to... so dirty. Just saying. Listen, Hoover ball. Okay, first of all, it's meant to be it played. It's a new name when it's in prison. Adam being who he is, <laughs> you're supposed to play with like, I don't remember the rules offhand, but the ball is like, supposed to be like five pounds or something or two and a half pounds. <laughs> Adam would only play with the 20 or 25 pound ball. Uh. <laughs> now, you know how hard that is to throw over a volleyball net. But to play a Hoover game, multiple games with this ball, it was just, it was, it was outrageous. <laughs> Some things never changed. He, he mentioned the basketball. Let me just say that I'm thankful he was missing an ACL. <laughs> because if he was not missing an ACL, it might have been a donut from this end. Oh, I might not have even scored. And it wasn't like the tall guy posting up the short guy. Listen, this guy is one of the more athletic guys I've ever met in my life. But it was yeah. fun, though. I think that was another thing. He and I were competitive with each other. I mean, you could even say ultra competitive. But it never got nasty. It never got to where we would talk you know, smack to each other or we'd get mad. It was always a mutual admiration there while maintaining our level of competition. The things that stand out for me are those, of course, but I can remember I'd have a long day at work. First first group with the, the release at lunch was Unicor. So I would go straight to the gym. Adam would, he worked in recreation for you, you guys listening. He actually got his workouts there in the morning and me, Knowing that I had clemency and parole boards, I wanted to stay with Unicor because that was a that was considered a form of programming. So as much as I wanted to go uh, work at the same place that Adam worked at, so we could work out together more, I knew that staying in Unicor would benefit me down the road. So I stayed there. So we were released at eleven o'clock. So they called it Daryl's Corner. I had like a little corner to where you remember it, the bench that you can change into a squat rack, I, everything, and I'd have all my weights set up there. Well. I would have that, that workout done. I would teach my class right after. And a lot of times in the morning, I might do a run. And then Adam's always pulling me out of work, so I'm doing that. So in the evenings, I'd work on my courses, and I'm exhausted. But somebody would come in and say, hey, Adam's out there. Your man's out there for you. So we'd go out, and we'd walk. How many miles would we end up walking each night? Uh, it's just miles. And listen, and I don't do that. You know, I don't go out to the yard just to go out unless it was him, you know, and we'd walk and we'd just, sometimes we wouldn't say anything. Sometimes we just, we'd make lap after lap, just walking beside each other. You know, you, you didn't need words to know that you had somebody that, that, you know, you were that close with, that you were just, you know, you were just hanging out with, with the individual. And then there's other times we'd talk. So that was one that stands out to me. The second one that stands out to me, and we've talked about this a few times. I, to this day, I still tell people about this because this is crazy. I had injured my knee. I don't know if you remember that, Adam. Sunday mornings used to be my distance run. I had ran a blistering 10-mile run. I, like, I finished like in 57, 58 minutes, something like that. I come in to my unit, and my coach for A-League summer ball, summer basketball, he says, hey, uh, we got a game today. I said, no, we don't. We don't play till Tuesday. He's like, no, this is a makeup game from the time we got rained out. So long story short, I end up, I'm pretty sure I tore a meniscus and I tweaked it really bad. So I think, you know, your standard 24 hours off and I go right back at it. <laughs> and Adam, on top of him missing an ACL, you had done something. I can't remember what you had done like a couple weeks prior. I can't, I can't remember what it was. But anyway, I'm in my little Daryl's corner working out and here comes Adam and I'm in the middle of a, of a circuit and he's got this, I'm going to keep it PG, uh, uh, a certain eating grin on. 
<laughs> and I finished my circuit. He's like, what's up? I'm like, what's up? What are you doing? He goes, ah, oh, nothing much. He's like, hey, uh, let's run a marathon. This is dead summer. I'm thinking we're going to start training for this, and we're going to give ourselves time to heal from the wounds that we're nursing. And uh, I'm like, okay, uh, when do you want to start training for it? He's like, uh, no, let's just run the marathon. So I'm thinking in a week, 30 days. I was like, okay, when do you want to run? He goes, ah, let's go, let's do Saturday. I'm like, Saturday is in two days from now. <laughs> so yeah, we ended up running a marathon. He had two injuries. I had an injury. And they opened up the yard for us, and we, we ended up printing that out. That was pretty hard. Then we had John. John Knock, the old man, who was my celly, uh, the guy that led the, the Zen meditation. Tragically, he's also serving a life sentence. The third thing that stands out would just be the times that we would uh, play in these volleyball tournaments, team volleyball. <laughs> and our team was me and you. <laughs> Playing against a whole other team. Yeah. And what would tell them about the tattoos? The tattoo of the ball. Oh, no. It's just, that's always the purpose. <laughs> you know? If you ask who? To try and tattoo somebody with the ball. You know, send, send them Sorry. home with a ball mark on their face. Yeah. Let's fast forward a bit because you guys separated, what, like 2010? 11? 2010. And then you kind of basically lost touch. I mean, I would send emails back and forth, but it was few and far between. And I know even there was maybe a good chunk of time that Daryl, you and I kind of lost touch. So why don't we talk about two months ago? Let me just preface. Neither of you had relief. You were both lifers. Daryl, you did get parole and we're not going to go into that. I'll post your other videos because this is getting kind of long and you guys could see why he was a federal inmate that did get parole. Very few do. So you would go up to the board, but they would always deny you or say you had to wait longer. So you're both apart for a long time, but now you're both at home. What's going on? He got the news first. And I remember when you told me, you're like, Daryl got parole. And man, I was so excited. And even though, you know, we were focused on, on our situation, on me getting relief as well, like everything was on our are we going to get clemency? Am I going to get this motion resolved? We didn't know what was happening. And there was a lot of highs and lows. And that was one of those high moments, like knowing that he was getting out, you know, that was a big win. It was just kind of crazy. The timing that as his date is getting closer, all yeah. of a sudden it's like, Hey, I, I got a court date. I have, they're hearing my motion and Oh my, they granted my motion. I'm like, Man, we're getting out at the same time. Is that right, possible? Right. Like, how crazy is that? That's crazy. I mean, still to this day, it's surreal. It's, I can, in fact, I can remember the first video I did with you, Ro, right after I got the decision. I remember at some point I said, look, you're next. Adam's next. You know, you want that to manifest. And you put everything you can into the universe. I know, you know, I did. I would pray or think or whatever you want to call it every night for you guys. But there's that part of you that's like, mm, you know, so my mind was like, okay, when I get out, what can I do to be part of uh, team A and row? So what can I do to, to help her, to help you while I'm saying, okay, I'm hoping he gets out. But then when it happened, I remember I was in quarantine. I'd been in quarantine since like June 30th. And that's when I'm really email, emailing her. And then she told me, she's like, he's getting out. I was like, what? And they limited our emails there. And it's like, I'm going crazy because I want to call. I want to email, but I can't. And I'm, so I'm just, yeah, it was nuts. Hey, the only downside was that we didn't get a chance as we were flying across the country and, and stopping to see family that we couldn't have taken a detour. Oh, don't no, listen. We're going to have time to get together. Yeah. I'm not even worried oh, no about doubt. that. We're going, to, we're going to get together. Whether I come to you, you're coming to me. It's going to you're happen. coming here and you're not going home. You're getting a one-way ticket. <laughs> I'm going to build the whole thing for everybody because that is going to be amazing to see you guys reunited in person for the first time in all these yeah. years. But we're not letting you leave once you come out here. Are you crazy? <laughs> hey, I can remember, I know time's getting a little short, but I can remember a few years prior, 
I thought I got clemency. For those that were listening, and I know we don't, we're not going to go into it. For military prisoners in the federal system, both in, or in the military system, we get annual clemency hearings. Basically, it's just a sentence reduction. However, I can remember telling you that I that I thought I got it because the president of that board was like, he, he his concluding remarks was, "You presented a very powerful case case for clemency for your brother." And, you know, I got a lot of mitigating factors in my case. And then there's the things that I did in prison. And we, that's a whole new ball game. But everything was pointing in the direction that I thought I was going to get it. And then I didn't. And then it was just like at that point, you're kind of like, I don't know. You know, I would have conversations with myself, not that I talk to myself too much. At least if I do, I don't try to answer too much. I thought it was it. But it, it wasn't. They say really so. smart people talk to themselves because we both do it too. (laughs) But I remember that so vividly. And I also remember every time you went up and and then you would get those denials, Adam would always tell me that he was so grateful. There was one thing he was grateful for that he didn't get parole because of how he would watch you go way up and get spun around and then go way down. And I sometimes couldn't comprehend it. Like, what are you talking about? (laughs) If we had that shot, but I don't know if you want to speak to that, but watching you go through all of that stress was also really difficult for Adam. I think yeah. Daryl, I think Daryl hit on it earlier too. Part of the way his, he structured his time was to ensure that every time one of those boards, clemency board or parole hearing, any, any of those things came up that he had everything well documented. All of his time was accounted for because you have to give those people a reason to sign. Yeah. Up. And yeah. For me, I had a little bit more latitude, at least I believed I did at the time, mm-hmm. where I could kind of pursue what I wanted to pursue. Uh, I wasn't bound by those dates, and I'm very task oriented. So if there mm-hmm. would have been a board, like I know I would have been the same exact way, and I saw what he put himself through, you know, in order to make sure that he he did everything he possibly could, you know, to ultimately win pro to get what he received, I've said, I, I was fortunate. The things that I was able to accomplish, especially after we split and I wound up at another facility, many of those things were things I honestly didn't want to get involved in. I felt like mm-hmm. I kind of got pulled into and I am so, so grateful now that that happened, that sure. I compiled this crazy list of accomplishments that was never really my goal. It just, it was that we were on that same path. Yeah. Both really wanted to improve ourselves and to continue to learn and to grow and to use that experience to the best of our benefit, because I know that we both always believed that eventually we were going to get out. Yeah. And for me to build on what you were saying, it wasn't just solely to build a case for parole because I was growing during this process, even if parole wasn't even there. I'm still growing as an individual, but to the point of building a resume, so to speak, for them, I wanted to make it hard, if not impossible, to keep telling me no. I can't go back in time and change whatever I did, no matter how much I want to, no matter how much remorse, no matter how much I regret. That's done. That's that's fit, accomplished. It's, it's, it's an accomplished fact, and I can't do anything about that. But what I can, what we can do as individuals is we can change how we view the present day and how we prepare for the future. That's what I tried to do. And uh, I knew it would have to be a paradigm shift where they had to look at the individual that's here in front of them as opposed to in the past. It's one thing to have these opportunities every year. It's quite another to have these opportunities and you have a very good case along with that opportunity. Your expectations get so high yeah, it was challenging sometimes. I think all of those things, they forge you in that fire. We're here. Yeah. We did and it. We're here. We all did it. And I think that's the perfect way to end this video. I always tell everyone, you just have to put your mind to something and fight for it and white knuckle it. And no matter who tells you you're not going to be able to do it or you can or that dream is impossible, you put your head down and you just trudge forward. That's what you have to do. And you guys are both beautiful examples of that. So thank you so much, Daryl, for being on the channel again. Is there anything else that we forgot to ask you or anything burning that you want to tell our audience? Anything embarrassing about Adam that you want to share with me? That would be really... 
<laughs> well, well, I think my earbuds are going out again. <laughs> I'll take that as a no. Did you ask a question? I didn't know you asked a question. Bros. No, he don't have anything embarrassing. Are you kidding me? Except the McCrapple, didn't he? But he told you that was McCrapple. Yeah, but you ate coffee and sardines, so I don't know who's worse, and oatmeal and peanut butter or something. I made that recipe on a video once. It's an efficient way to eat. You get everything. <laughs> We don't need efficiency. We want flavor and taste and all that fun stuff. Okay. All right, you guys, thank you so much for watching. I will link the other videos that I did with Daryl right before he got out when he was awarded parole. And he talks more about his childhood. And another interesting thing is both of you guys were told at a very young age that you were going to end up in prison for the rest of your lives, which is insane. And he talks about that there and the trauma in his youth that led him to where he is, was and now where he is today. So I'll link those videos up there. If you have not already subscribed, do it for Daryl, do it for Adam. And the fact that they're both home, click that button there or the red circle below. We love you guys and we'll see you in the next one. Love you too.